my presentation is the, tied to the prophecy and the crisis of October. Actually, I try to think about the two revolutions, the Chinese Revolution, Russian Revolution, and the step with the focus of the Chinese Revolution, because if the 19th century was demarcated by the British Revolution and the French Revolution, then the 20th century, to the great extent, was defined by the Russian and the Chinese Revolution, as well as the national liberation movements that as sequence. These two revolutions not only aim to create a new society within their own countries, they also understood their revolutionary paths as part of a great experiment to seek out a future for the world. Obviously, now, the, uh, most of the uh, discussion on these two revolutions, full of the sense of failures. It's, it's, a, it's a, the starting point almost has become, started from the failure to think about this issue. I will talk about this later. So that's why from the 1917 to 2017, it twists us in a feminine in the, very, in the very best place of these two great revolutions, their once revolutionary visage has long since grown obscure. In the 1990s, following the disintegration of Soviet bloc, the slogan farewell to revolution took the Chinese intellectual scene by storm, articulating the Asian version of Americans' proposal of end of history. In Russia and the Western intellectual spheres, the October Revolution is often seen as the original thing of the Soviet bloc's dissolution, canceled there from its outset. Meanwhile, all talk of socialism and communism has already transformed into the discussion of why the former failed and the later is impossible. So these are the general situation. Um, the directly related to this judgment is a revaluation, evaluation of the revolution's character. Was the October Revolution a socialist one or an Asian social revolution? Was the Soviet nation it founded a state of capitalism or a socialist state? Such questions were already cancelled within, concealed within the discussions of the relation between the February and the October revolutions. So I will see the, the lot. Uh, so the arrival of Putin's epoch has been a turning point. The promoting con reconciliation amongst the contending revisionist views the October Revolution rescued Russia from the war. The Treaty of Brest-Litovsk, which had been millioned by the Bolsheviks' enemies for a long time, was also abolished by the Soviet government in the wake of German, Germany's military defeat. After the October Revolution, there were debates even amongst the drifting fragments of those exile white aristocratic people. This was due to the belief among a portion of white Russian uh, Eurasianists that the October Revolution was a detour taken by Russia in order to maintain its own capacity to act in the face of intense pressure from Western powers. So we know that the contemporary rise of the Eurasianism in Russia. For this reason, it could not be negated outright. The national self-determination promoted by the October Revolution ultimately took the form of alliance, preserving to the greatest extent and even expanding upon Tsarist Russia's territory, population, and authority. In sum, for modernizers, 
the October Revolution used the industrialization to clear out feudal impediments for the nationalists and the patriots. The Soviet war of self-defense to resist and defeat Nazi Germany's assault amounted to historical achievement. And for Euro-Asianists of the epoch, the October Revolution rallied the country for a decisive transformation of the Russian Empire. The October Revolution, in this sense, couldn't be totally negated. One century later, the true challenge faced by this revolution is the negation of the first proletarian state, or the first state governed by the proletarian dictatorship, which was created by the revolution. The possibility of the proletarian state is not only inadmissible within the epistemology of the liberalism, but is also legal apart as a political form from the road taken by the contemporary Russian state, and I think the Chinese state too. So, and it is precisely within the complex and the contradictory atmosphere that we see the ambiguous form of the commemoration on the December 19, 2016, because last year was the, the uh, centenary of the October Revolution. The President Putin issued a directive for preparations to commemorate the centenary of the Russian Revolution. But it's very interesting. He targeted the name 1917 Revolution rather than the October Revolution. Means that we had a centenary for the February Revolution and the October Revolution together. Not mention the conflicts, confrontations between these two revolutions. So that was the uh, differences between these two revolutions diminished, almost. So the Minister of the Culture of Vladimir Medinsky announced, looking back now at the incidents which occurred 100 years ago, we absolutely cannot deny our elders' efforts in attempting to establish a new just society on this earth. So in order to cure the suspicions against the commemorations of the 1917 revolution at home and abroad, on the September 13th of 2015 uh, and the September 3rd, 2016, issued successive presidential orders to the Putin, signing the legal decrees to establish a monument forever commemorating the victims of political violence. So on the one hand, you have the ceremony for the 1917 revolution. But on the other hand, you need to establish monuments for the victims. However, this decree didn't. The text never indicated, according to the Wen Yuan, a specialist in Russia, in what period of Russian history this violence was carried out. More important still, the laws never indicated, with regards to the say the violence, who was the aggressor subject, nor the aggressed object. So these are kind of the, the game of the ambiguity for the memorate the, the 1917 revolution. So the Great Purge was a serious inci- the, 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 uh, situation in the 20th century in the Soviet history. But what's the relationship between the October Revolution and the Great Purge was also obscure. So it's, it's, on the one hand, you need to think about the, the memory for the memory of the, the, the revolution. But on the other hand, how to deal with that, the, uh, the tragedies that happened in the 20th century was still the ambiguous. In China, it was also quite interesting because China is different from Russia. We are still in the communist in power, right? So we claim that uh, we are still loyal to the belief of communism now. However, there were no public discussions, and not allowed to even, on the centennial, with the exception of a closed-door conference in the Great People's Hall. So no public discussion, only one official conference within the 
great people's hall. So these two countries, the two revolution, in the two centers of the revolution, and their way to deal with our own history, it became inevitably ambiguous. So how to deal with these kind of the issue? I will come back to the issue by the end of my talk. Now I move to the, the two other questions. I think that the, about the, uh, the uh, October Revolution, there were two horizons or the perspectives to interpret this revolution, the European and Asia or the non-European. With respect to the explanations and evaluations of Russian revolution, there have always been two horizons, European perspective and non-European, particularly Asian perspective. While mutual points overlap in each view, their differences have always remained clearly distinct from the beginning. In terms of the political moments of the epoch, the European perspective has developed according to the overall context of European workers' movement and the communist movements, as well as their antithesis, their critiques posed against the liberal democracy, the rights of men, and the market economy, amongst the others. So if you look at the, even the left-wing critique of the October Revolution, like Lothar Lusa Luxemburg, was started from that kind of perspective. However, in Asia, the Asian perspective, by contrast, focused on the aspects of the imperialism in, in that period, problems of colonialism, and the moments for national liberation. So here, the three questions, it's from, the, I think that they're quite interesting. I tried to rewrite the documents, the controversy and the debates among the socialists during the wartime and the, uh, immediately after the October Revolution uh, in the European socialists, Russian revolutionaries. And I found that the three questions remain here in different ways in the contemporary theoretical discourse in different ways re-emerged here. Amongst the myriad debates surrounding the October Revolution, at the core, three fundamental problems come from the European view or they emerge from the perspective of a European socialist movement. These are the first, the question of war and peace, especially Lenin's advocacy for withdrawing from the war and the dilemma of seeking a revolutionary strategy within Russia. These were historical more. So contemporary, the, the theories were not so much focused on these, it was completely historical. The question of the right to national self-determination, especially the right of national minorities to secede, including the problem deriving from this of the relationship between a national revolution and a class revolution. We know that the Rosa Luxemburg criticized Lenin by arguing that you're actually, by raising the issue of the self-determination, actually betray the proletarian the, the interests, the, the internationalism, and so on and so forth. And finally, the question of proletarian dictatorship or the problem of the relationship between the democracy and the transitional state. These are another issue, whether or not a proletarian state should inherit the legacy of bourgeois democracy and freedom. That's the, uh, another kind of the debate of issues. So the, I will focus on the, the three questions. I will focus on the second and the third one because the, the war and the peace issue, I will... Uh, uh, so the right of the self-determination. Let's say that the, in the mid... In, after the... Uh, 1848, the, the Marxist position to the self-determination at the beginning was quite clear. They focused on the class revolution rather than the national issue. So the, the, the very famous the slogan, the Poland issue, because at that time a Poland issue was a very important issue, must be liber Poland must be liberated 
not in Poland, but in England, that in 1847, Karl Marx said this, means that you need to do the international proletarian revolution to liberate the Poland rather than launch the national revolution within the Poland. So this is also the position held by the Karl Rosenberg after the October Revolution and during the wartime, his heard debate with Russian revolutionaries. However, when I reread these documents, I found that uh, after the 60s, uh, Mark, Karl Marx also changed a little bit of his uh, the position. In 1866, Marx himself drafted a talk dedicated to the Polish question as part of the instructions for the delegate, delegates of the Provisional General Council, the different questions. The heading for the French edition of this same piece raised necessity of annihilating Russian influence in Europe by implementing the right of nations to self-determination and restoring Poland on a democratic and a social basis. That was the first time I, I found in the Marxist writing, the first time he used the term of the self-determination. So, but it's in French only, not in other edition. In English edition, German edition, no such term. In English edition, I can only read that was a Polish question. Only the same term, the Polish question. Only in the French edition, they, he talked about the self-determination. That's the, for Lothar Luxemburg, the right to self-determination was an unforgivable crime that the Russian revolutionaries had committed toward the international moment of the working class. He said that, she said that, while they showed a quite cool con contempt for the constituent assembly, universal suffrage, freedom of praise, and assemblage, in short, for the whole apparatus of the basic democratic liberties of people, which taken all together, constituted the right of the self-determination inside Russia, they treated the right of self-determination of peoples as a jewel of the democratic policy for the sake of which all practical cons considerations of the real criticism had to be stilled. So this is the, her critique. So the Western Marxists and the communi communists believe that the 19th century Western Europe was facing a revolutionary wave of the working class, struggling to take power for themselves. The Eastern question, on the other hand, was merely a passive problem of imperial hegemony. That was expansion, the Russian expansion to the West, or find the interest in the East and also that in the process of decline of Osman Empire, the frontier area of those small nations, that the Russian actually encouraged them for the independence. So that's why the self-determination was only the strategy raised by imperial powers. That's why the proletarian moments was not interested in such issues. Consequently, their attitude towards the national question was totally different from that of the reformers and the revolutionaries who were their Eastern contemporaries. The first reaction from China, as well as other non-Western countries toward the revolution, concentrated on the position of the Russian revolutionaries concerning the Eastern question and oppressed peoples, which differed radically from the attitude of Western powers. So Lenin said that uh, after the, the, quite early, he said that in Eastern Europe, Europe and Asia, the period of bourgeois democratic revolutions didn't begin until 1905. Until 1905 means that the, after the Russian-Japanese war, the failure of Russian's failure triggered domestic revolution. And that revolution also triggered the revolution in Poland, and later in, in Persia, and later in Turkey. So a series of re revolution later will constitute a series of so-called events of 
Asian awakening. So the revolution in Russia, Persia, Turkey, and China, Balkan Wars, such is the chain of world events of our period in our Orient. In our Orient means that now our Orient is in age, was in the age of revolutions. It's different from old the Orient. It's, it's a new Orient. So the multiple beginnings of the new age, from my point of view, is that the so-called, for me, is the 20th century started from the 19, it's a kind of the, it's a series of the 1904 Russian Japanese war in Northeast China and Korea. We know that the Russian Japanese war happened in Northeast China, but the crisis started from Korean Peninsula. And the, 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 also the Britain was also engaged, all the powers engaged for this. 1905 Russian Revolution, 1905 6 Polish uprising, 05, 07 Iranian Constitutional Revolution, 08, 09 the uh, Turkish Revolutions, 1911 Russian Revolution, the 1917 Russian Revolution. So the October Revolution erupted in the final years of the First World War. Consequently, among its the Western left left's reflections on the Russian Revolution, we can quite clearly see a tactical and a strategic divergence deriving from working class movements and the social democratic parties of Europe. Another part of these revolutions lineage, however, is nearly invisible Asian's revolutionary lineage. Because in that sense, most of the observation about the October Revolution started from European, because it's really in the European war. So that from that perspective. However, if you look at the 1905 revolution, 1907, 1909, 1911, and 1917, you could also see that the Russian Revolution as a reaction to the series of revolutions in Asia. So it's not only the events happened within the European wars, but also have some reactions to the long chains of the uh, developments from the beginning of the century, especially 1905. So in that sense, like uh, Eric Hofstrom, he talked about the short 20th century started from 1914. For me, the short revolution is still short because it ended earlier, started from 1905. It's a, it started from the revolution rather than from imperialist war. So, because if you only think about imperialist war, no clear distinction between the 20th century imperialist war and the colonial wars and occupation, colonialism in the 19th century. But the revolutionaries in outside of the Europe was really new. So if we place the Russian revolution which was a derivation of European revolution. Within the ranks of the awakening of Asia, might we see things differently? On the December 3rd, 1917, what happened here? The Soviet government issued a text. These are old stories, but we need to re raised in the so-called anti-terrorist wars. We can see that the, uh, the, the issues. To all the Muslim workers of Russia and the East, and announced the conciliation of the secret treaties that had aimed at the carving up of Persia and Turkey and the Russian occupation of Constantinople. Of course, later, the Soviet Union's policy, foreign policy was not followed strictly that the doctrines. Still, they take the consideration of geopolitical considerations. However, that was very important. On the January 25, 1918, the Third or Russian Congress of Soviets announced the Declaration of Rights of the Working and they exploited the people and they restated the right to self-determination and the conciliation of all secret treaties. So compared with the Wilson moment, October Revolution as one link of Asian awakening had a much longer and a deep impact on Chinese and other revolutions in non-Western countries. So because at that time, even during the May Force movements, the Chinese, 
those Chinese intellectuals even know very little about the domestic politics, but they immediately attracted by these the, the, the slogans, abolished all unequal treaties and the two documents issued to the Muslim world and oppressed nations. That's why the right to self-determination was so attractive to those the, the oppressed nations, that are the peoples here. Lenin criticized the Chinese revolutionaries' proposals for the socialist and the democratic program to overcome capitalism, arguing that Sun Yat-sen's perspective was utopian and populist. Actually, in, in terms of, it's not now the populism, it's the narodist in Russian. However, he said that the irony of history is that the narodism, under the guise of the combating the capitalism in agriculture, champions the agrarian program that, if fully carried out, would mean the most rapid development of capitalism in agriculture. That was very different. <laughs> Means that because the narodists in Russia, they imagine that the narodists, that the Siberian commune can be thought as the future, communist future, overcome the capitalism. So that's why Lenin was criticized, the, the Russian narodists. However, he said that the Chinese narodism is, sounds very similar, but actually very different. In those marginal people, they need to took the socialism as a way to develop their agrarian capitalism. So the October Revolution took place after the 1911 revolution. Consequently, the method of using a transformation in a state form to pursue the socialist development can, to a very large extent, be seen as a response to Asian Revolution. Because he, in the 1912 to 1913, after he read, after he read the Sun Yat-sen's outline for building up the new republic, the one of the issue was nationalization of the land, which was a response to his par comparison after the, uh, 19, the failure of the 1905 revolution. He thought that there were two roads. One is uh, the American road. Another was the Prussian road. Prussian road protected the private property as a land, a small, young landlords, and the nationalization of the land in the western regions of the America and redistributed as a way. But Lenin at that time thought that was a completely capitalist one. However, after 1911 revolution, he thought it could be sort of, sort of a socialist one for the nationalization of land and the redistribute. And in order to find the way to develop the agrarian agri capitalism, however, that agrarian capitalism in Asia contained a certain logic of the self-negation, means that towards the socialism. So this is a very dialectic way to think. think. So Lenin's theory of the right to national self-determination and his understanding of the significance of revolution in backwards nations in the epoch of imperialism were both developed following China's 1911 revolution and had a close theoretical relationship to it. So when Lenin was discussing China's revolution, he never supported the demands for the independence of Mongolia and Tibet and the Muslim areas. Why? This is also another kind of the question. Because Lenin argued for, started from Poland, Polish issue, Ukraine issue. But also he didn't talk later, even later, not, not so much about the Baltic Sea countries. So the first similar to the regions inhabited by Hungarian and the Czech peoples in the Austro-Hungarian Empire, moments for independence in China's border regions would in all likelihood lead to these regions falling into the hands of more rapacious and powerful neighbors. So that was he mentioned this when he debated with Karl Luxemburg. Karl Luxemburg said that if you look at the Austria-Hungarian, Czech, Slovenia, and all those countries, they don't want to be independent. Why? Why you encourage the Poland, 
Ukraine or the other countries try to be independent from Russian empire. Lenin said that the, no such general national question. All the national questions that happened in the concrete circumstances. If those small two conditions, I think, the one, if, you are, if your neighbors were even, even more evil empires, imperials, then they remain within the old empire could be better. So the neighbors was Russia, Japan, and Britain. So that's why he said that those neighbors were not necessarily secede from the chain that the other early republic. The second not only was the level of capitalist development and the general cultural level of China's central regions higher than that of the border regions, but the Buyuwa revolution and the nationalist movements had already developed. Preserving the territorial integrity of China would therefore be of benefit to the development of the revolutionary moment and consequently also to the capitalist development. So that's what he's I think that the reasons for his position. So with its establishment of the 1921st, the Chinese Communist Party, influenced by the uh, Kuomintang and the Soviet Russia, accepted the national self-determination and supported the self-governance of Manchuria, Tibet, and the Hui peoples. It also advocated for the establishment of a federal state on the basic premise that it overturned the operation of global imperialism and achieved complete independence for the Chinese nation. Following the Great Revolution's failure in 1927, the Chinese workers and the peasants' Red Army established the Soviet base areas in Jiangxi. During that time, the Chinese Communist Party reaffirmed the right to self-determination as part of its constitutional program with the right to cessation being the core content for its principle of national self-determination. National self-determination was always a positive political value that was equal to later developed into the national liberation and the slogans of the equality between the so-called minorities and the majorities. But the Chinese Revolution didn't demonstrate the pro problem of national secession. On the contrary, the revolution emphasized the problem of the unity of the oppressed, the solidarity issue. So that was against the background of imperialistic, the international context. The question of the seizure of power, that was the other four questions the, uh, the concerning the socialist state. I moved to, from the self-determination to the state issue. The question of the seizure of power, should the proletarian revolution implement social self-governance via a long period of economic transformation, or should it directly exercise the authority to manage the state through the violent seizure of political power? So that, I think, that from first international, down to the second and to the third was remain the question up to now. Still, whether or not you need organized a new form of the state, or you just change, transformed the mode of production, more state gradual process of that, uh, like uh, from the early Proudhonian uh, approach down to the Leninist moments. So that's the difference. Up to now, still, we can see the traces of these debates in the 19th century social, among the socialists. And still, we can see that the, in the contemporary the, the theories. The second question, should the socialist state inherit the fruits of the Buyua democratic revolution, such as a universal suffrage or a system of the legislative assemblies? So these were still the democracy issue was still here. Is the proletarian dictatorship a dictatorship of a governing party or of the proletarian as a class? So we, later, we, in the 1960s, 70s, we, when we read the new class, we actually back, go back to the early debates on these issues. So the question of the transitional period, the state capitalism or the socialism? So how to define the nature of the socialist state? 
These four questions was concerned the whole period of the Chinese socialism. The socialistic critique of the Soviet Revolution, let's see that uh, the two radicals and the conservative within the left wings. In Kosky's view, the victory of the October Revolution and the failure of the Paris Commune was simply because the former gained the support of the peasants, whereas the latter had no way of forming links with the peasantry. Luxembourg believed that although the director immediate the seizure and the distribution of the land by peasants was an effective policy for strengthening the socialist governments, its negative side lay in the fact that the direct seizure of the land by the peasants has in general nothing at all in common with the socialist economy. Uh, by his also Luxembourg shared with other members of the Social Democratic parties the criticism that the Bolshevik lack understanding of and respect for democracy. The proletarian dictatorship was no longer the dictatorship of a class, but rather the dictatorship of a governing party or a small minority of leaders over a class. Well, these were major critiques of the, that revolutions. So now I move to, I try to re-examine these questions, these critiques through the ways of the Chinese revolution, the conditions for the Chinese revolution. Yesterday, we also talked about the class issue when Professor Wen talked that we also, people here the, the raised the issue, how to deal with the issue of class. Here, I cited Maurice Meissner's early work. He pointed out a fundamental features of Chinese society, namely the weakness of its social classes. He said that the, there exists in China a weak bourgeois and an even weaker proletarian, but it was not only the modern classes who were pony. The modern Chinese historical situation was marked by the weakness of all social classes. Some others, for example, the Liang Zhuming, argue that no such clear class distinction. These were the products of the industrial societies, not like in these kind of the societies. All weak, especially when he talk about the all classes are weak, means that even the landlords, feudal, so-called feudal classes are also weak. After the mid 19th century, after the, the uprising of Taiping, those class lost their honors, lost their the, the authorities. So that became all the social classes are weak. As a result, the basic road for the Chinese Revolution became the use of active method, like high level organization and the politicization in order to transform formerly weak levels of society into radically new subjects, far exceeding their structure, their structure weakness. The fundamental conditions for these kind of transformation included the following elements. The political party that had the con uh, conquest of power as its ultimate goal, a social movement that produced new kinds of revolutionary classes through the struggle for land revolution. The, a political military force that was capable of organizing a key elements of these struggles and a global perspective that was capable of linking the struggle to destroy the feudal society, social relations inside China together with the global anti-colonial struggle. So that was why the central power became, how can we occupy the central power to transform the weak class structure and promote those weak the lower social class up to a politically strong social class, that the working class as a leading class. But as Professor Wen mentioned that, the working class was so minor, was really minority of the whole Chinese population. The majority were peasants. However, peasants, politically speaking, was weak. No, economically speaking, socially, they're a majority. But politically, it was very weak. 
So that's why the revolution, I think that the, the, the conditions for these, the long Chinese revolution. The Chinese revolution took place in a society where there was a, some level of the industry, but which was still the fundamentally agrarian society. Although the Chinese revolution had a close link with the strength of the urban proletarian, it fundamentally had the peasant masses at its base. A key premise for the peasant masses becoming the main military force of the Chinese revolution was the transformation of Communist Party from being an organization that took the city as a primary locus to being one that took work in the countryside as its key focus. Because of the weakness of the social classes in China, the bourgeois and the landlord class had no means by which to grasp the economic lifelines in order to lead the social change. Quite a contrary, they entered into alliances with the state and the forces of imperialism as well as other military forces in order to seek advantage and project their own interests. As a result, the problem of political sovereignty or one might say that the problem of the capturing political power would necessarily become a key problem for the Chinese Revolution. A long state building process from 1931 in Jiangxi to the 1949. So the 1949 was the, the establishment of People's Republic of China. However, it was the first time, it was not the first time for the state building process because the first Soviet state was built in the 1931. So that was from 1931 down to the 1949 is a continuing process of the state building as a form of the Soviet, the socialism, the state issue, and as a strategy and as a way to mobilize the people, the mainly the peasants. So no any other revolutions had a, such a long process the building up the, the, long, the process of the state issue. This is a, like an October Revolution was happening in 1917 and afterwards established in the monument, moment, event. So that was why in the Chinese Revolution it's difficult to indicate which event as a monument event, as a mark of the Chinese Revolution. Chinese Revolution is a long process full of the different incidents and the events. So I think that the, in order to understand the Chinese Revolution, that the People's War was very important. The People's War is not a purely military concept, but it is rather a political category. It is a process of creating a new political subjects and it is also a process of creating political structures and the forms of self-expression that are adequate to these political subjects. In fact, before the establishment of the People's Republic of China in 1949, the Chinese Communist Party and its local organs of political power had already completed the land reform in 20% of the country. So land reform was completed in the 20% before the 1949. Octobers. So that during the course of the People's War, the party merged with the army and the red political power is amalgamated with the peasant masses as a result of land reform and witnessed a transformation of the relationships between the party and other political parties, as well as with other social layers and their political representatives. The amalgamation of the party and the military, the merging of the party with the peasant movements, and the land reform through the military, the management of the economic life by the party and the Soviet area governments on its leadership, and the cultural movements, uh, uh, the cultural mo movements that were initiated by the party in the March work, not only transformed the specific content of the revolution and its essential task but also by means of the motiv uh, motivated amalgamation of the party, military, political power, and the peasant movements created a radically new revolutionary political subject. 
It was not purely based on the working class. It's also not that though the majority of the participants was peasants, however, the political subjects was not the peasant subjects. It's completely new subjects through the long process of the People's War. So that's a long politicization process of that in order to create such a political subjectivity. So here I do some, comp the, the Paris Commune and the October Revolution took, took place in the economic and the political centers of Russia and the France. Whereas the practice of people's democratic dictatorship under the conditions of people's war emerged in the remote villages, far removed from the centers of power. So that's why the Chinese Revolution was not possible like a French Revolution and a Russian Revolution as a very short revolution. You should have the from the margin to the center was a long process. The Chinese Revolution had to transform the peasantry into the subject of the revolutionary people, and this historical destiny signifies that the revolution couldn't naturally and spontaneously develop from the class characteristics and the demands of the working class and the peasantry, but had to pass through the military struggle, political struggle, and the struggle for production, as well as struggle in life in order to transform the class characteristics and the demands of the participants. This was a historical process involving a high degree of politicization. The party. Can we replicate it? the Luxembourg's position, and I believe that this dictatorship was not a dictatorship exercised by people or by a class, but was a dictatorship of a party or even by a leader, the leader of the minority of party. This party, having been formed through the People's War, was a super party for me. It's a possessing key elements superseding the logic of political party, in a sense. The super party means that this party was not prepared to share political power with any other parties within a constitutional framework, but rather through its own mass character came to originally, organically, constitute its democratic di dictatorship. The elements, the mutual amalgamation of the Communist Party and the mass movements the moment to build the country and the military struggle and the struggle for production and the mass line of going from the masses into the masses made the Chinese Communist Party not simply a vanguard party but also a mass movement itself during, before, I mean, the, before the 1950s. So it was not the, it's difficult to compare this kind of the party with any other forms of the party, especially in the European history, and even different from the Russian Bolshevik party because of this long process. So the people and its democratic dictatorship, the political concept of the people must also be understood by connecting it to the people's war. Even whilst the Chinese Communist Party in Habitually uses the Marxist language of class in order to summarize the people or the Chinese people in terms of several basic uh, categories, such as the working class, the peasantry, the petty bourgeoisie, and the national bourgeoisie. Yet, what the concept of the people indicates in the course of people's war is, in fact, precisely the process of political formation of people itself. The violent form of military struggle, the uneven ratio of the forces between the revolution and its enemies, the sharpening of the relations between the interior and the exterior under the conditions of war mean that these people's democratic dictatorship possessed a broader social base, but was also founded on a clear distinction between ourselves and the enemy. So that was very clear that the, that the logic of the politics at that time. So, the, from, for me, it was now that if you try to, how to understand the contemporary transformation, 
how to understand the contemporary transformation of, from political perspective. I summarize that is from the party state to the state party, which I called, labeled as the statification of the party, laid in one respect to the concentration of the centralized power in the hands of the party, and in another respect, led to an even growing uh, bifurcation of between the party and the masses. And it means that the party has been integrated into the framework of the state and reduced itself from political organization to the state apparatus, more or less a purely a state apparatus. So that the keep distance from it's the early elements of the mass movements almost disappeared. So that's the, uh, the, 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 the difficult, the, the issue. Oh, here. I, I not finished my uh, the, the editing of the, the PPT. I think that the, because yesterday we also talked on about this issue. Here, I try to summarize some issues. How to think about the, uh, uh, the, the first day we also had a roundtable discussion on this. I, I want to, uh, from this historical, the, the transformation, long historical transformation, reflect upon the issue of failure. How to think about the failure? Uh, most of because as I said, that the, for the most of the reflection on the 20th century Chinese, uh, Chinese Revolution, Russian Revolution, was based on the fact of the uh, decline of the Soviet bloc. So that was socialist camp was gone. And uh, then integrated into the global capitalism. And uh, China was still under the leadership of Communist Party. However, the party itself has transformed largely into such a great state. And uh, in order to be maintain its power and the development passes within the global capitalism. So that's the, uh, the, the general situation. In that sense, the traditional socialism, the state socialism in the 20th century failed. That was the basic starting point, a lot of the reflections. However, I think that we also need to think about this issue from certain kind of the internal perspective about the dialectic between the victory and the failure in the 20th century, according to those revolutionaries' view about the history. So here I try to mention two figures were so important figures in the 20th century China. One I mentioned was Lu Xun, who was a literary figure, and his philosophy was so-called resist, disappear, or revolt against desperation. The resist, to resist and disappear means that the whole struggle not start from the affirmation of hope, but start from the resist of the disappear. Because eventually, the disappear, disappear itself was nihilistic concept too, as the uh, kind of the uh, easy idea of hope for him. So the resist, the disappear was a starting point for the social struggle. If you started the only, started from immediate the hope, then you were immediately gave up your struggle. So this is where the, which means that the recognition of the failure as a starting point of the social struggle. That's why he said that the Sun Yat-sen was a re real revolutionary. Why? Is a perpetuate the revolution. Means that the Sun Yat-sen failed and the struggle, failed and the struggle. That's why I prove him as a revolutionary. So this is uh, the first slogan, uh, the ideas. That's uh, Takeuchi Yoshimi also raised the issue by reading, rereading Lu Xun and the Lu Xun's reading on Sun Yat-sen. And the second, I think, is the Mao. Mao's theory was 
mainly was after the 1928, the big failure of the North ex Expenditure Revolution and the uprising, the mil communist the military movements. So almost completely failure, military failure, retreat to the, those poor areas. But he published a series of articles. One is why the Chinese Red Regime can sustain or exist. He started from talking about the unevenness of the imperialist system in the globally speaking. And then he talked about that, that unevenness within one countries and created the, the weakest link. And that created the historic condition. But these were only the objective condition. A revolution always needs the subjective condition, which means that you already still have those people, revolutionaries, organizations, and the early legacy of the social movements that were still there, so which means that the, that was the starting point. So he started from the failure, but he talked about the victory. He said that we know that the, the famous slogan he raised in 1948, that the logic of our enemies were try, fail, try, and fail again. Uh, that was the, uh, always the, uh, the, eventually that was the, that the logic of the failure was our enemy's logic, was not our own logic. That the people's logic was a fair struggle, fair struggle after the victory. So that was basically based on his understanding of people's war. That the how can we create the long process of politicization and create the subjectivity rather than based on resort to the, the, the only the naturally speaking is a naturally existed social class rather than the political process. Of course, now the condition was completely different from the 20th century. The, the historical global conditions, the domestic conditions, and the, the other social conditions are very different. But these kind of the idea, think about the failure, was still enlightening for us to think about the contemporary social struggles. So thank you very much.